Good to see you. I know so many of you, and many of you have uh, gotten a little grayer. Some of you have gotten a little balder. So have I. Oh, my goodness. But it's so good to see you. And, you know, the best part is, and I was telling this to Josh, it's close to home. I can drive home tonight, so it's a real blessing. It's, it's so cool to be here. Um, the Galileans at the time of Jesus weren't like most of the Jews in the rest of the world. The, Gal uh, the, the Judean Jews were somewhat like the Galileans and sometimes not. The world was affected by this guy that came along 300 years more than that before the time of Jesus whose name was Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great was on a mission. He wasn't just going to conquer he was going to change the world to help everybody think like Greek philosophers and think like the Greeks. That's you. That's us today. That's the way we think. That's our logic. That's our understanding of history. It's our understanding of sermons. It's even our understanding of the Bible, just the way it is. <laughs> However, at the time of Jesus, Jesus, remember... He was a Galilean, and they didn't think that way. Now, Jesus, we know, is God in human flesh. He's got a few advantages with that, as you know. However, he was among Galilean peasants, which are among the simplest, most concrete thinking people in the world. They're not stupid. When I say simple, they're not stupid. But they have a very, very concrete way of thinking of things. And I could talk for hours on that, which I promise I won't. But you needed to know that because the Jews were, well, what, what Alexander the Great did, he was Hellenizing the world. Hellas was the original name for Greek. So he was Greekizing the world, as it were. And that had caught on even among the Jewish people. But Jesus was with Galileans. And there was that simple Hebraic thinking up in that area of Judea, of Israel rather, at that time, and down in the Judean area around Jerusalem, there was some of it. You need to understand this because he didn't give great mystical teachings like we often attribute to him. If you've been to one of my biblical dinners, you know what I'm talking about. They're very simple concepts for people to grab onto and then carry home with them. I understood, I understood what he said because he equated it to a table or to a piece of bread. That was his teaching. I can remember a table. I can remember a piece of bread. And when it came to when his disciples kept asking him, well, when are you going to set up your kingdom? Because they were under the impression Jesus was going to do it in their lifetime. As a matter of fact, imminently. But Jesus kept pointing to them, pointing them to something that they weren't, they weren't connecting. They understood it perfectly. But because they were presuming that Jesus was going to be the conquering king, they never guessed why he kept talking about his disciples, his followers, as a bride, and him as the bridegroom. You say, well, Paul goes into that a little bit. Yes, Jesus goes into it a little bit. No. He actually went into it a lot. Because when you start thinking the way they thought, looking at the world, looking at life, looking at scripture, in this very, uh, can I use the term non-abstract, I don't want to get too academic here, but a very concrete way, all of the illustrations made sense. The Bible is full of idioms. You know what that is? It's just a statement, a phrase, a word, a sentence where, well, okay, look, I'm from the 60s and from the 70s. And when I was in Moldova last uh, year ago, um, uh, excuse me, no, it was last May, um, uh, I was trying to explain this to a group of people who never thought of this before. And the way that I put it, I said, what if I said to you, and these are Moldovans, I said, what if I said to you, far out. 
And I said, what does that mean? Oh, something very far away over there. And I said, I'm from California, from the 70s. It means excellent. <laughs> really? Yeah, that's an idiom. Jesus spoke in such ways where the disciples could get what he was saying, but because they had made up their minds about him, they missed it. But it didn't keep him from repeating it. Let me show you how this worked. I want to talk about a Galilean-style wedding. It could be a wedding from any part in the entire region, but the Galileans kind of had their own specialty version of it. And it was something that Jesus would talk about. First of all, marriage in those days was something that was, it was an obligation. Love was not a consideration. If a bride and a groom happened to like each other, that was a plus. If they loved each other, it was rare. However, it brought, when there was a marriage, it brought two families together. And it joined them in their minds by blood. Suddenly the families are related. That family over there and my family here, we got these two together from these families, and now they're my cousins. They're blood relatives because these two were brought together. I'll explain this in just a little bit, a whole lot more. It was like Solomon having those 700 wives. Why did he have 700 wives? Because he was now through marriage related to the king or the warlord or the head of a, a city-state or something because he married their sister or their daughter or whatever. They were all peace treaties. And you can't fight your relatives. So marriage was really important. And if you did it in a village, it doubled the size of your income usually and your influence in the village. It was very political sometimes. You can imagine. So marriage was an obligation. And here's how they did things. Now, there could be variations on this. There could be a million variations on it, but I'll give you kind of the basic version in a perfect world because otherwise I'll talk you to death tonight. I'm already doing that. Let's pretend that I live in a, a modest-sized village, a village that's large enough to have a protective wall around it and a gate in the wall. This is very important. Well, I'm in this village, and I'm a merchant. And I'm doing business with some other guy in the village. And we're, as usual, haggling, arguing in a back and forth. And it sounds very hostile, except it's quite friendly and arguing back and forth with each other. And we're trying to strike a deal. And suddenly, with all the noise and yelling and haggling that's going on, I hear this loud squeal come from behind me, and lots of children laugh, and I love children. And I turn around, and here are all these kids playing back there, and suddenly they got very noisy, and I realized the squeal came from this one little girl who was a little embarrassed about it. And she's about four years old. And I turn back to haggle and I think, wait a minute. And I look over at the little girl. She's healthy. Obviously quite healthy enough to make this terrible squealing sound just because she was playing. She plays well with her friends. And I know who her father is. He's the weaver on the other side of the village. I, I know who this guy is. Of course I will. You know... She would make a great bride for my son, who is five. <laughs> now, right now, you're saying, this is getting weird. <clears throat> no, they wouldn't be married at this time. But you definitely, if you could, you'd want to get them engaged before she gets grabbed up by somebody else. And I know her family is honorable. And honor and shame drove their society, and honor was everything to them. And so, I think... I've got to get this gal before somebody else grabs her to be their, their daughter-in-law. So I go home and I say, I think I found somebody for our son. My five-year-old son's going, well, what's going on? He doesn't care. <laughs> and I said, put together a feast. This could take days. It could even take weeks. It's not like something you just say, what do I got in the fridge? You don't have that. So you put together a very honorable feast. If you've been to one of my biblical dinners, if you haven't, don't worry about it, but you'd have one of those three-sided triclinium tables because it's a rich man's table and you want to really honor what's about to happen. And then you get the best food that you can. You bring it over and you don't tell the, 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 the weaver's family about this, but when everything is set... 
then I would send my brother, who is my intermediary. Uh, by the way, there's a lot of these in the Bible, aren't there? Including a really good one. There is one intermediary between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah. Wait a minute. They actually practiced this. This pointed them to something. You see, it's an idiom, isn't it? So I take my brother and I send him over to the weaver's house and he pounds on the door and he says, I have a gospel for you. I have a gospel for you. You know what a gospel is? It's the message of Jesus, right? Yeah, it is, but not then. That word had been around for a really long time. And the word gospel meant I have a message for you that has no bad news and is only good news. Apparently started when a soldier came off the battlefield to tell a general, I have good news, we won. And that's how they understood it. So he, I have a gospel for you, I have a gospel for you. Well, if somebody pounds on your door at any time in those days, it's usually bad news. But when he's yelling gospel, the guy comes down, I need to speak to the weaver, the father of the girl. And, of course, he comes to the door. My brother says, come with me. There's a feast set for you now. What is he going to do? Well, let me get my calendar out. No, he just drops everything and goes. Why? They don't have clocks. They have no sense of time back then except one day in seven is a Sabbath. And so he comes out the door, and the, my brother leads him honorably to my house. He comes in. We go through all the hospitality gifts and wash his feet and set him down at the table. And I wine him and I dine him for at least a couple of days. Yeah, well, the, what's the family thinking? They don't care. They don't have clocks. They just know feasts could go on for up to two weeks. If that's where he's at and he's inside the village, it's okay. If there's an emergency, we know where to find him. And so as I am treating him with all this respect and we talk, we fellowship, we just relax around the table for maybe days. Finally, when I feel he is softened up enough and honored enough, and I've really honored him like a king, I am his slave, as it were. I just treat him like that. I ask him the question, how about your daughter... And my son getting engaged. And I bring out my son and I show him. And he looks at the son and he inspects my son. And finally he agrees. Immediately I clap my hands and in comes a scribe. Think about it. You're not going to write stuff down. You're going to have to have somebody do it for you. The most literate people in the world in that age were the Hebrews. And still on a really good day it was only 11% of them could read and fewer could write. So I'm bringing in a scribe. He's going to write down, take dictation for what we are about to haggle on because we have to decide on the terms of the wedding. We're going to haggle on it. And as we do so, he's going to write everything down in duplicate. This is the marriage covenant. Now I'm going to come back to that word in a little while because it's a very important word. You've heard it, but you may not have heard it like this. So we start haggling and we go back and forth and we haggle first of all all right the father of the girl says what are you going to pay me for my daughter because i have to buy her to be a part of my family that's just the way it was that was their time and so we haggle back and forth and we come up with well it's going to be 20 camels 10 donkeys and a small flock of goats and that's really talking him way down to be presented at their betrothal ceremony when they're of age to be married and so that all gets written down. And of course, what are you going to write it on? You're going to go down to you know, Staples and buy a ream of paper and get a pen. You're going to write it on whatever you can. You're going to write it on clay. You're going to write it on leather. Could look something like this. Could be on parchment if you're really wealthy. Uh, uh, that comes from Pergamum, by the way. If you know the seven churches, that's where parchment came from. Or um, uh, perhaps even papyrus. But either way, they're going to write it down. Now these are poor people, so they're going to use available things. They could scratch it into wood if they had to, but they're going to be two identical copies. So we haggle on the bride price. And then we haggle on other things. What is the bridegroom going to be to the bride? So how is he going to provide for her? Well, he's going to become an apprentice of his father. And so forth. And then what is the bride going to be to the bridegroom? Well, she's going to take care of the house and the family. She's going to milk the goats and she's going to have kids. Now, this goes into the contract. You ever wonder why it was such a disgrace in those days when you read in the Bible that a woman was barren and couldn't have kids? It was not only a shameful thing in those days in that culture, which is really sad, but it was also a breach of contract. Because in the contract it would say she will bear this many kids and of which genders. 
How do you do that one? It really increases your prayer life. And they'll go through the dowry, the girl's dowry. She has to have a dowry. The dowry is a certain amount of possession, something of value, or it could be money, or it could be something else. But whatever it is, if something happened to the bridegroom, that he died, or was disabled, or disappeared, you can imagine in those days, it was pretty easy for people to disappear and never be heard from again. And so if something happened, how is she going to be taken care of? Is there money? Or can you liquidate something? Because now, and again, forgive me for being a little bold here, but she would be considered damaged goods and unlikely to marry again. So someone's got to take care of her and it would put a huge burden on the family, so she's got to have a dowry that's at her home that can take care of her if anything happens to that bridegroom or if he divorced her, which would be really, really bad. Let me show you one of these. This is a replica, but this is a ketubah, a covenant. The Hebrew word ketubah. You may have heard it pronounced ketubah, that's Yiddish. Hebrew, ketubah. And this is a contract. This one happens to be a little older than Galilean. This one actually dates back to the 19th century B.C., And it's written in a funny little language called cuneiform. It says this, A man has taken a woman as his wife. She will bear a child. If man divorce this woman, he shall pay 50 shekels of gold. Those aren't coins, by the way, that's a weight. 400 grams of gold, five minas of tin, two minas of silver, uh, which is about a kilogram, and shall go wherever he wishes. If woman divorces this man she will pay 50 shekels of gold and will reside in the house. She gets the house. (laughs) And then here on the back side, it lists the names of the people who were witnesses. This is actually a pressing of a real one of these. So you can kind of get an idea of how they might have looked. In the case of Galilee, they're not going to have that luxury. So they're going to write it on anything that they can. Well, after they haggle on this whole thing, they get the ketubah together. Then the scribe reads both copies to make sure they're absolutely perfect. And they say exactly what these men had bargained on. And of course, you can imagine there's probably a lot of shouting going on. This is their way of doing things. And when they're done and they're satisfied, they are each given their copy from the scribe. And then they take it home. The one man, of course, the father of the little girl, he goes home. He, they, they give a holy kiss and a holy hug. He goes home filled and satisfied, maybe with a few of the leftovers or whatever. And most importantly, his copy of this ketubah, this covenant. And he goes home and puts it in what they would call their holiest shrine. And so does the papa of the boy. It's right there in his house. What I mean by a shrine is not what you think of here in our modern times. It simply means the place where they keep all the ceremonial cups and plates for things like Passover and kosher meals and that sort of thing. And they would put it in there because it's very honorable. You may have uh, read 1 Corinthians chapter 6 recently, but in there... Paul actually in Corinthians uses this term twice. Once it was in the it was talking about slaves. But in the other context, it's leaning into a bride bridegroom relationship. When he tells the Corinthians who were Greeks and there were Jews among them, but Paul was a Pharisee, and that means he was an anti-Hellenist who was now preaching to the Hellenized. Isn't that interesting? Doesn't God have a great sense of humor? And he tells them church, you were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And it's in writing. So this is one of the first little clues that pops up, but it's only a small thing. So they go home, they put these things away in the family safe, the shrine, and it sits there until the kids are of age to be married. The ripe old age of like 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. Really young. A lot of you parents out there who have already been through teenagers probably are thinking, I wish we had it that way today too. (laughs) They were very practical back then. And so one of the papas decides, you know, the kids are of age now. We should get them together and betroth them. The betrothal ceremony came next. And it was a legal marriage. In fact, once you were betrothed, to get out of it, you had to have a legal divorce. But once you were betrothed, you couldn't live as husband and wife 
for another year. I, I don't like this tradition. I honestly, from a Western standpoint. But this is what they would do. They would have this betrothal, and then another year goes by, and then you would have the wedding ceremony. But that whole time, that whole year, you're legally married. You just can't leave as husband and wife. Wow. Talk about anticipating something. Mm. So, the papas start talking again. And they say, we need to have a betrothal ceremony. When should we do it? Well, look, the weather's good. It looks like it's going to stay good. Let's do it the, you know, two days after the next Sabbath. That will give us time to put things together. And they decide they will. And they're going to put together a parade. Each family. Because this is really fun. If you've ever been to Israel, I know some of you are going soon, you'll see on Thursdays, typically, down at the Western Wall, Bar Mitzvah Day. And you have all these parades of, of boys coming in with their families and people beating drums and blowing shofars and playing all kinds of instruments and families dancing and throwing candy and all of this. It's, it's just a big celebration. Same kind of thing. Except this is for a wedding. This is for the betrothal. So they decide they're going to get it together. They, they get the best clothes they can for the kids to don them up that day. Not their wedding clothes, but their nice clothes. And, and they don't have a lot of clothes. Remember, the people back then are so poor. Maybe they ate every other day. They really went out of their way to have a feast. Maybe the one pair of cl- the set of clothes they have on is the only clothing they have. That's very common back in those days. It's not like you can go down and buy something or even trade for something or even make it. You're putting all your resources into just staying alive back then. So you do your best you can. And of course, you get the musical instruments. You want to make lots of noise. And finally, the day comes. And the first thing that happens is the bridegroom, this young boy, along with his friends, his brothers and his male friends, they'd go down to the synagogue where he would dunk himself in what's called a mikvah. Now I could go off on this for a long time and I'm not going to do that tonight because we want to get out of here at a reasonable hour, but it would be a ceremonial cleansing where you are dipping in this, this pool of water, which is called living water, by the way, because it's not stagnant, it was fresh. And then you would come out of the water, and once you stepped out of the water, they had a term for that. They said you were born again. (laughs) Oh, yeah, that's where it comes from. So that means he's being born again into a whole new relationship this day. He's going out of his old one. Now there's a new one coming on. And she would do the same thing, of course, separately from the boys at a different time of day in the mikveh. She would do the same thing with her sisters and the girls. And then we'd be certified somehow, depending on what they, how they wanted to do that. And there's lots of ways to do that. So anyway, so they all go back to their houses. Once they get back to the houses, one of the parents says, all right, let's go. And somebody steps outside with something like this. You know what this is. It's a shofar. And, I mean, they're obnoxious. They're just (laughs) noisy. But that's the idea. Let the other family know. This is texting in those days. (laughs) Blow that thing. The other family across the village says, I know what that means. They're headed out. We've got to meet them because we're going to have the ceremony. And so the family that blew the shofar could be the papa, uh, the boy's family or the girl's family. And they head out with a big parade, leading the girl, leading the boy, each family, and singing and dancing and cheering and making all kinds of noise. And villagers kind of get in line with all of this. And they go out too. And finally the families with all this noise and music and dancing following in these parades come together at the the village gate and go out the gate together. And once they get outside the gate, uh, why out there? The Greeks invented the town square. The Hebrews did everything out by the gate because at the gate you have a very important group of individuals, sometimes one, sometimes many. They're called elders. They ratify things to be legal. They're not, well, they're judges, You don't have to stand in front of them. They just have to hear. They have to listen to what's going on. And then they can say it's legal. And they would declare it as such. The elders are at the gate. And you've got nothing but room outside the gate. So you go out there. This is where you're going to have the ceremony because you're going to have a big, big crowd. You can't do it in a house. And there's no town square. So out you go, and both families go out, and villagers are coming along because they want to see what's happening, because life is boring back in those days. <laughs> they don't have, you know, those little things you hang in your ear and you can listen to music. They don't have any uh, stereos, nothing. Just, did I really say stereo? Do we still have those? <laughs> anyway, you see, when I grew up, and they head outside, 
And, and then one of the brothers, this is my brother, right? You know, he, go, he's, he directs four kids who come through the gate who are carrying a bundle of four poles and there's this big piece of cloth wrapped around the top of it and it's all wrapped up nice and neat. We would put this together earlier and they come out and my brother says, put it right here. And of course the boys come over and then they set the poles which are about seven or eight feet tall with this beautiful white piece of cloth on top or the nicest piece of cloth they can get. Each of them grabs a pole and pulls back. The next thing you know, you've got a canopy held up by four poles with four boys holding the poles. They have to hold the poles, otherwise it collapses. As you know, it's called a hoopa. I love that word, hoopa. It's not a hula hoop, it's a hoopa. And it's a canopy. And this is where the most important stuff of the entire ceremony is going to take place, underneath that canopy. If you've ever seen the play, or perhaps even the movie, Fiddler on the Roof, one of the most beautiful scenes ever filmed in any movie at any time takes place under a hoopah. And they sing, even one of the, it's a soliloquy, and one of the girls sings uh, very yearningly that here's my sister getting married. Is there a can- will there be a canopy for me? Because she wants to stand under this thing. It's very romantic, but it's also very beautiful. This is what they're talking about. But the hoopah wasn't there to keep the sun off. It worked for that, by the way. But it was there, well, you know, maybe you've heard this before, that it was a prayer shawl put on four poles and you were getting married under the prayers of God's people. Uh-uh. They didn't have prayer shawls like that in those days. It didn't work that way. What it represented to them, finest piece of cloth they could find, by the way, it was to show them the old story that's in the Bible, the account of how God in a cloud descended on the mountain where God gave Moses the covenant. It's a place of the covenant, so it happens under the glory of God. That's what the hoopah was all about for them. And so the hoopah is set up, and then the boy and the girl who are you know, young teenagers, they come and they're dressed as nice as they can be, and they stand under the hoopah. You don't need a rabbi present. The elders are over by the gate, the family is surrounding the, the kids underneath the canopy and the kids holding up the posts. And now you've got a huge crowd around the outside. Villagers. Perhaps there was a passing caravan. You know that, of course, Israel was literally the crossroads of the world. The spice roads, the silk roads, and other trade routes between Europe, Africa, and Asia had to squeeze through this tiny little piece of land. So you've got caravans all the time. They would stop their camels, get off and go and watch. There might be soldiers guarding. Romans aren't going to get close, but they'll stand in the back and they'll watch because life is boring. And then you would have you know, maybe thieves and beggars, they'd stop doing what they're doing. They'd come over too. Because when you put the hoopah up, it wasn't just for guests. Listen, they wanted witnesses. Guests are nice, but you can't make a covenant without witnesses. And now the setup is complete and you have surrounding this hoopah all these witnesses. Now, as a pastor, I occasionally do weddings. And I've kind of changed my, my format over the years because weddings are so easily disposed of by couples who, well, let's say the new car smell wears off of their wedding and their marriage. And suddenly they're just like, well, they cheapen it and they want to go out the door. Uh, Witnesses are essential to a covenant. And when you have all of these witnesses there and people make promises, if they break those promises in front of the witnesses, it's not considered bad form. It's considered treachery and shameful. And that sort of shame in that part of the world in those days, your family never recovers from because you weren't an individual. You were an extension of your family. They didn't understand individualism in those days. So when you bring these families together, you're bringing together two organisms. Now, here's the situation. They're under the canopy. They're surrounded by the witnesses. When I do a wedding, I borrowed from them 
Because whenever a promise is made, especially when they invoke the name of God, in the name of God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for our weddings or what have you, then now I have those people do at my weddings what you're going to do right now. Whenever a declaration is made, all the witnesses shout, Amen. All the witnesses shout, Amen. Ooh, that's good. Amp it up just a few more decibels. All the witnesses shout, Amen. Oh, that's it. And so you've got the couple. You've got to picture this. Here's the hoopah, and here's the boy and the girl, and then the papas step up. And as they do, the, here comes the scribe. The scribe can read. So they hold up their ketubas, and they say, we have the ketubas, and they hand the, one of the scribe one of the ketubas, and he opens it up, and he reads it to the, all of you. And it has the bride price in it, and the dowry, which is going to be, in this case, 250 pieces of bronze. And uh, uh, it has the, you know, all the other terms. And as it's being read, it starts out with, well, that's the price of the bride. So the papa of the bridegroom now needs to pay the papa of the bride the bride price. 20 camels, 10 donkeys, and a small flock of sheep. And, or goats, whatever. Animals. Okay, so, and so he motions to his brother. Who leads them all up? You say, that's going to take some time. Yes, it is. They got nothing but time. <laughs> Life runs slowly back then. So they bring all the animals up. People get out of the way. The papa of the bride goes up and begins to inspect each of the animals, look at their teeth, make sure that they're not too old, that none of them are being halted, that it's all good quality animals. And as he inspects the animals and looks at them, finally, after however long it takes, he nods over to the papa of the bridegroom who bought the bride with these animals, and he acknowledges they are acceptable. And then all the witnesses shout. Amen. And now he cannot ever say in the presence of anyone in the village or anywhere else that one of those animals were bad or that this guy cheated me. That's how it works. That's why I like doing it at my weddings. Mm. So the next thing that happens, um, the bride's dowry comes in. Now, you know, he's going to have a bag. It's a little bigger than this, but he's going to have some coins in it, and they're going to be bronze coins. The papa of the bride brings this. And he hands it to the papa of the bridegroom, pours it out on his hand, he counts it out, where, however he's going to do this and make sure that it's the right amount, and when it's the right amount, he puts it back into the bag or the bowl or the box, whatever he was handed, and he holds it up before all the witnesses, and it is true, correct amount of money, however he would say that, and all the witnesses would shout, Amen! And now he can't say it wasn't right. And neither can the bride's father and it's handed back to him. He keeps it for his daughter in case something happens to her new bridegroom. So that's kept on deposit. And then, after that happens, then it kind of begins to, to focus down in what's happening underneath this, this canopy. And the bride and the groom now have to do some things. And the first thing that happens is that they're going to exchange gifts. Now they could do this in another part during the wedding or during the betrothal as well. But the wedding gifts established a guarantee that we will be married one day. That's what the wedding gifts were for. It wasn't just like, here, this is formal. I like you. I'm going to give you a wedding gift. It was something that said, this is like the, the seal, the mark that says, we're going to go through with this all the way to the end. That's the guarantee. So it might be something like the bride would be given a piece of jewelry, maybe a bracelet or something, could be given a ring. Wouldn't be necessarily put on this finger, it could be put on any finger, it could be put in her nose. That's, that was very, very common back in those days. But she could be given a ring, it could be made out of well, just about anything, but if they were wealthy, it would be silver or gold or something like that. But what if the families were as poor as I described earlier? What do you do about that? Well, this thing right here, I don't usually wear necklaces except when I, I do a Galilean wedding. This is a bronze coin right here. It's, this coin happens to be what's called a Masada coin. It's from 66 to 68 AD. It's really old, but it's called a pruta. That's what it's called. It's basically a nickel. It's just a cheap little coin. It's an it's ancient nickel. However, if he didn't have 
any money or any means by which to give something beautiful to his bride as the seal of their relationship as bride and groom, as husband and wife, then he would produce one of these. Just a simple bronze pruta. And he would hold it up in front of the entire congregation. And nobody would think, what a cheapskate. They would all be kind of going, oh, that's really cool. Because when he hands it to her, they know he just gave her everything he owned right there. And so that was the guarantee. You have everything I've got. It's an amazing thing. And once the gifts are exchanged, all the witnesses shout. Amen. And now that is a done deal. They are actually officially sealed to be married. But that's not the end of the ceremony. And we have a long way to go yet. So keep your seatbelts on. Um, <laughs> The, I wanna, just something that, you know, Josh, I haven't talked to you about this yet, but this is kind of an interesting thing. When you're reading the book of Ephesians, please remember that Paul was not a Galilean, but he was also a non-Hellenized man. And remember, the Pharisees were a reactionary group against Hellenization. So the way that Jesus taught, Paul very easily related to, even though he only met Jesus on the road to Damascus. That was his encounter with him and a couple of other miraculous things along the way. But Paul did happen to write to the Ephesians. There were Jews among them. 10% of the people in Asia Minor and in Ephesus at that time were Jews. Maybe you didn't know that, but that was the case. So they would understand this and they'll teach it to the Gentiles. When Paul talks about that he chose us, Right at the very beginning, Ephesians chapter 1, to be his, for his son, before the foundations of the world, he chose us. We can take that in a very mysterious, esoteric, theological way. They would not have done that. When they heard that word chose, they heard a bridegroom's father choosing a bride for his son and making that arrangement. Hmm. And then later on at the end of chapter 4, Paul makes this funny little statement, very intense statement actually, where he said, he said, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The seal we think of pressed into wax. But because of the context from chapter 1, especially if you're a student of the Bible, all the way to chapter 5, where it talks about the bridegroom and the bride, church, uh, Christ and his church, being brought together as a bridegroom and a bride. You see this continuous touching on this context, bridegroom taking a bride, bridegroom sealed to a bride. The Holy Spirit was the gift. The Holy Spirit was the seal. And then finally... Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing with water through the word that he may present her to himself as a radiant bride. I'll come back to that one too. I'm going to repeat it later. But you can see the connections there. And it all had to do with that gift. But now it gets really, really sticky. Because now that they've exchanged the gifts, this is the one place where, well, everybody... All the witnesses hold their breath because this is either going to go really, really well or you're going to have fights break out and a possible riot occur. Here's what happens. While they're under the canopy, one of the papas or a brother, a relative of the bridegroom, takes as nice a pitcher as they have that has wine in it. Now, this is fermented wine. They did drink fermented wine. Why do you think they have all the prohibitions against getting drunk? They drank fermented wine. Typically at a meal, they would water the wine down four parts water to one part wine because you don't want anybody to get drunk and shame themselves. However, they did have a ceremonial drink that was used only in sips for various ceremonial purposes. It was called the cup of joy. And it was wine that was undiluted. He's handed a pitcher with undiluted wine in it. And a nice a cup as they have. Some sort of a ceremonial cup that would be used for a variety of purposes. The bridegroom takes the wine, the pitcher, and he pours it into the cup. Just a little bit. He doesn't need a lot. 
And then, with reverence, respect, and fear and trembling, he presents the cup to his bride. Now, here's where all the witnesses are going, oh! because when he extends the cup to his bride, he is giving her an option. She really only has it here. You look at the whole ceremony, this is really the only place she's given the option. The option is this. If you want this man to be your husband, even though these arrangements have been made, prices have been paid, all of the contracts and everything else, you want this man, you receive the cup from him, you take a sip, and then you hand it back to him. And he takes a sip. And that means done deal. However, if she doesn't want this man, as he's extending the cup to her, she could push it back to him and reject the cup. And it's her right to do so. And the wedding's off. The ceremony shuts down and you would think everybody goes home. Nope, fights break out. <laughs> everybody starts shouting, things are flying in the air, dust, people are in fist fights, whatever it might be. But nobody would deny her right to do it because this is the one moment she can say, I don't want this guy. It's an arranged marriage. That's the way they did it back then, in case you haven't figured it out. It's an arranged marriage, but she can call the arrangement off right there. Now, when she takes the cup, and she does, she receives the cup from him. This is a good thing. She takes a simple sip and hands it back to him, and all the people breathe a sigh of relief. And then the bridegroom, breathing a sigh of relief, takes the cup, and he takes the sip. And when he's done taking the sip, all the witnesses shout, Amen! And you're breathing again. <laughs> but, here's what you need to know. What you'd be looking at here if we had our bridegroom and our bride here, and they had just done this back and forth, now that they have partaken of that cup, you're now looking at, now this is going to sound really strange, so I have to explain it. And you're going to need to know this. I'm not just dumping information on you. You're looking at not just bridegroom, bride. You're looking at brother and sister. That sounds really goofy. But that's the effect. This is the essence of what you as witnesses would be seeing. Because now the two families have been joined together by this couple up front. Now they are related to each other and they are considered to be physically related to each other even though it's not the wedding night that's a year away they are considered related to each other like brother and sister that's what a covenant did with anyone whether it's a bride and a groom they would now have family relationships with the other family they are now all family cousins brothers sisters they're all related think of it like this when God made a covenant with Abraham, God now is related to not only Abraham, but Abraham's people in the future. That's why they are God's people. He literally means that when he says it. They're my people. They're my family. And as you read the Old Testament, you find that God considers the Jews not the bride of God, but the wife of God. That's his relationship. Why? Because he made a covenant with them and he wanted them to see in their own minds how deep the covenant went. It's not a business contract. It is a marriage covenant related. And he continues to re-ratify this covenant through Moses and other means to remind them that you are my people. We are now related. And even as a wife, as a wife to God, as he pronounces it again, this is the way that he wants them to picture the relationship. It's not really the physical relationship, but that's the way he says you've got to see it this way. Because that's how close we are. This is why when the ten tribes to the north, if you're a student of the Old Testament, when they went to civil war with the tribes to the south, and never had a good king, and continue to worship idols, God finally tells them, all right, I'll give you your divorce because you don't want me anymore. 
It was a tragic day. But now you can see how this worked. Now, this brother and sister thing here. Uh, let, let me kind of give you an illustration of how this works. Let's say that you have, whoever you are, that you have an eccentric brother. Some of you are going, how do you know my brother? <laughs> you have a really eccentric brother. He's just like, he's a great guy, but he's a half a bubble off plum. And your brother calls you up one day. He doesn't like people. He's a black sheep of the family, so he doesn't like the family. And he just doesn't like people. And he doesn't like technology. He's just out there. And one day, you get a call. And it's your brother. And he says, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. Well, what's the good news? He said, I just won the Powerball lottery. I'm a billionaire. You know, the first thing that goes through your mind, and you want to share it with me, right? And then you say, well, that's wonderful. What's the bad news? He said, I've already spent my money. I bought an island out in the South Pacific. It's my island. It's very small. I had a facility built on it. I've had it stocked with food. It's got everything I need for the rest of my life, and I paid the guys who built the house and stocked it with food to never say another word so you don't even know who they are. And I'm going there, and you'll never see me again. And then he does. Oh, wow, click. <laughs> and you do never see him again. Now let me ask you a question. Is he still your brother? Yeah. Why? He is, isn't he? Because he's blood. He's blood. This is what you're seeing here with this bride and this bridegroom. They're now blood in your eyes. They're now related to each other by a covenant. And a covenant, interestingly enough, had a strange intention to it that we say so easily, but only understand traditionally. If you're married, and some of you have been married more than once, and I, I'm not holding anything like that against you. I have something to say about that in a minute, so, so hang on. Back in the 1600s, the Anglican Church wrote a little book called the Book of Common Prayer. In the back of that book, in the appendix, there are ways to do weddings and funerals. And chances are, if you're married, you've been married, that part of that wedding ceremony was used in order to put you and your bride together or you and your husband together. And in that little wedding ceremony in the 1600s, they still knew what I'm telling you, what I've been telling you about this family relationship that comes about by a covenant. It was forgotten about around 1900 and suddenly it became an abstraction, became part of romance, became part of tradition and the true meaning just faded from view. But back in the 1600s they knew whenever a bride and groom took a series of vows and they concluded the vows with this phrase, until death us do part. When is your eccentric brother no longer your brother? When one of you dies, it's until death us do part. That's the way God intended marriage to be. That's what we and many places in the world have forgotten, lost, pushed aside for reasons that we just plain forgot or that we're just looking for loopholes to get out of the relationship. But the truth is, that if you're married today, right now, I'm not talking about those of you who have been married, but if you're married now, you need to remember that you made vows, promises. You took God's name on that vow, and you may not have known this either. But the third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, is not profanity. It means that you don't swear by God's name and then not keep the vow. Because you brought God in on it. So you made the promise. You swore to God. And when God brings two people together, He has blended you together in His eyes and in your minds to understand that you are now brother and sister, as it were. And it's until death you do you part. That's what He wanted. That was His intention. 
Now, some of you are probably thinking, my marriage is a train wreck right now. And I don't know who you are. I'm not talking to any specific people here because I don't know. I absolutely don't know. But I will tell you this, that when you got in front of that church and that pastor led you in that, cer- that little wedding ceremony and you made those vows, you invoked God's name, you put his name on it. You don't take his name in vain. And now you have the picture of how God brings people together in a covenant and you did make a covenant whether you know it or not. Now you do. And here's the deal. If your marriage is a mess, the covenant is the bedrock on which your marriage is built. Don't get out the jackhammers and try and break it up. That bedrock is solid. It's the house that's in shambles. Rebuild the house. Repair the house. Whatever it takes, and it could take years, I can guarantee you it's worth it. That's what you do. And the last thing before I get back to a little bit more of our betrothal ceremony and move on from that. The last thing is some of you are saying, yeah, but I've been married and divorced. What about me? I've been married and divorced several times. What about me? I've been married and divorced several times. I'm thinking about doing it again. What about me? (laughs) Now you know what to do with it if you're in that condition. But if you've been married and divorced, twice in the book of Revelation, Jesus says something I find very comforting. He says, behold, I make all things new. This is where you start. You've got to start over, you start right now. If your marriage is a mess, rebuild, starting now. It will be worth it. And by the way, your spouse will bless you for it and perhaps be shocked by it. That's what a covenant is. Never forget it. It's throughout the Bible, time and time and time again. (coughs) Now, let's go back to our bride and groom. The bridegroom pours the cup. Then he takes the cup. He extends it to the bride. The bride doesn't reject it. Ah, yes. And so she takes the sip and then she hands it back to him and he reverently takes it. Oh, good. And he takes the sip. And when he does that, His only real line that he has to say throughout the whole ceremony is this. He looks at his bride and he says, you are now covenanted to me by the laws of Moses and Israel. And then either by implication or out loud, because they all know this is going to happen anyway. He says, I will not drink of this cup again until I drink it anew with you in my father's house. Seriously. You say, where do you get that? You can find it all over the place when you look. The commentators know. And he doesn't just do it once at his father's house. He does it six times. The Last Supper. Here's Jesus with his disciples. He takes a cup. He takes a pitcher. And at one point in the evening, he pours the wine. He then says, he says, this cup means the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins of many. Take it, all of you, and drink it. For I will not drink of this fruit of the vine again until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. That line does not belong in any Passover at any time, anywhere. It suddenly comes out of left field because the disciples knew he was referring to a wedding. Why is he doing this? Remember, they had presumed that night is going to be the trigger that's going to send Jesus with swords to take over, throw out the Romans and set up his throne of David there on the Temple Mount. That's what they're presuming. And they presumed that all the way until the the ascension when Jesus ascended off the Mount of Olives. What are they saying to him? Are you going to establish our kingdom now? (laughs) Stay in Jerusalem. Holy Spirit's coming. You'll figure it out then. But That's the essence of it. They didn't get it. But Jesus was talking about a wedding at the Last Supper. In other words, guys, we are now officially bound to each other. My father is your father. We're related. I'm your big brother. You are my little brothers. We're related. All the followers who come after you, same thing. We're related. But like a good bridegroom, and I'll explain this in a minute, I'm going away for a while and I'm going to come back when you don't expect me. 
like a good bridegroom. They knew this. They heard it, but they didn't get it because they were thinking other things that drowned out the message. Praise God, it got written down for us. Well, after that, the bridegroom then gives the bride a veil, a brand new veil that's given, made by somebody in his house or wherever he could get it, and she, right in front of everyone, would take it, put it over her face, so it covered everything but her eyes, and she would tuck it into this, it was like a headband that she had covering her head, and she would tuck it in there, and everybody would shout, because now the ceremony was complete. The veil simply meant that every time she left her house until she is officially married to this man, so over the course of the next year, she will always wear this veil. And it says, I am keeping myself pure for my bridegroom until he comes for me. You're the bride of Christ. The world is gnawing away, trying to erode our purity as the church, as the bride of Christ. Your veil is your purity. You're keeping yourself pure until he comes. The world says, take that thing off. It's inhibiting you. Take that thing off. You don't need it anymore. But your veil is your purity. And that's why staying in obedience to Jesus Christ according to his word is so important. It means you know who your bridegroom is. In fact, you've seen him and you know he's wonderful. I think that any Christian that takes off their veil and acts like the rest of the world has forgotten what he looks like or has never seen him in the first place. So that would conclude the ceremony and everybody shouts one last time because they've been there all day. They've had a wonderful time. It's a great break from the drudgery of their lives. And now the hoopah is packed up. Everybody disperses. The soldiers go back. The beggars go begging. The thieves go stealing. The rest of the people go back to their jobs and what in the village or whatever they're doing, the caravan packs up and moves on or maybe even makes camp and everybody goes home. But the bridegroom goes home with his family and the bride goes home with her family. And now you have a waiting period, a full year before the wedding actually takes place. You may remember this over in John chapter 14, starting in verse 1. Jesus is at the Last Supper. He's talking to his disciples. And of course, you have this huge, massive packed dialogue that he gives them. A monologue, rather. And one of the things he says, he, after he's, uh, just let me back up. The Last Supper was a Passover. In those days, Passover was not a Seder. Seder means order. You do things in order, and you see things in order, and you sit there and you, you do your thing, and it, boy, it tells you about Jesus and Moses and everything else. In those days, it was called a celebration. And it was their second happiest feast outside of Sukkot. It's later on, after the fall of the temple, it became very serious. But that night was supposed to be happy and we're celebrating. And then Jesus says, oh, by the way, one of you is going to betray me. All of you are going to desert me. Peter, you're going to deny me three times, but (laughs) don't let your hearts be troubled. Whoa. (laughs) He said, you believe in God. He's talking to you. He's talking to his disciples. You believe in God. Believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many. I knew you were going to say that. That is King James English. And it makes sense. It makes perfect sense. The translator saw that. And the word is not mansions. The word is simply a generic word for rooms. But if you're going to heaven, you're not going to live in a hovel, are you? You're not going to live in a hut. You're going to live in a mansion. So their conclusion was appropriate. Very appropriate. But the word is simply room. What kind of room? context dictates it. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go there, where? To my father's house, the bridegroom, to prepare a place for you. And if I go there to prepare a place for you, I will come back to take you to be with me where I am. You know where I'm going. (laughs) They said, we don't know where you're going. They weren't thinking the same thoughts. But when the message got written down by John, it was pretty obvious they had understood it finally like a bridegroom who has just betrothed himself to his bride. Jesus, in a sense, betrothed himself to his disciples and his followers. And then, like a bridegroom, he's not going to stay and fight. He's going to go home to his father's house where he's going to add a room onto his father's house, where when he, at the wedding, 
goes and kidnaps his bride and brings her back to his father's house, they will live in that father's house for the rest of their lives together. They don't go out and get a home in the country or a condo downtown or something like that. They, it's a compound. Families were generational groups of people. And if you were to walk into a place like that 2,000 years ago, you got generations from grandbabies, great-grandbabies, all the way up to the patriarchs and matriarchs of the family living in the same house. And when you have somebody get married, they're brought into that house. The bride is brought in and, they, and the bridegroom has to build on a room which is part of his priority. To get that thing done, he has one year to do it. If you've ever been to Jordan, are you going to Jordan? Okay, if you ever go to Jordan or you go through any Arab area, which isn't really likely right now with the tensions, but you'll bypass some Arab villages, you'll find that a lot of the Arabs, and the Jordanians especially, never finish their houses. They're like three, four stories high. They're like, it looks like an office building almost, but it's a house. And when you ask them, well, why is it not finished? Because we have people that are going to get married and come home and live with us. They do the same thing. I shared it with our Jordanian guide. She hit the roof. She says, we're doing that. That's what I'm looking at in the Bible. I said, yes. Wow. She got so excited (laughs) because she knew it was true because they still do it to this day, especially among the more tribal Arabs. That's what they do. So uh, so as a, the bridegroom, he's got to go home with his family and his responsibility, build a room onto the house. His second responsibility, he's got to prepare a feast. It's got to be a really good feast because everybody's coming to the father's house for the wedding feast. So he's got to get the tables, he's got to get the food, dried food first and fresh food later. This is an enormous cost. So his resources are going to be stretched to the limit. He's going to have to do a lot of work to do this and he goes to work on that and he has a year to do it. In the meantime, the bride goes home and she has to build a wedding dress. Now, she may be able to borrow one and resize it from somebody else in the village. That's also a possibility. But she's got to borrow jewelry. And so her wedding dress, it's not a white silk wedding gown. It's as many colors as you could put on it because remember the trade routes of the world go right through Israel and they can barter for caravans to get even silk from China or weavings or what have you from Vikings. I mean, people up in the the north anyway, not Vikings then, but you see what I'm saying. And so she can get all of this beautiful cloth. Her dress would be like a big hoop skirt, except without the hoop, it would just be layers of cloth, one built on top of another, extremely heavy. And of course the jewelry, Oh, there, there's an example of this in the Israel Museum where they have a Yemenite bride wedding gown and the Yemenite Jews were so isolated for so long that they probably are doing the same things people did in the days of Jesus with the same traditions and the same dress. And this dress is beautiful, it's big, it's silky, and it has necklace after necklace after necklace after necklace with huge pewter and tin baubles on it and and things that hold perfume because well they didn't bathe much and didn't smell really good so they got perfume so she smells great and her her headdress her, it goes way up high and it's got coins the dowry has been hammered with holes in it and stitched onto around the veil. Those are her dowry coins. And then, oh, it's just, it's magnificent. She's got a year to build one of these with the, her sisters and her friends. And they put it together. And then the day draws close. The son brings his papa over and says, I'm done with the room. He inspects the room. It's only a formality. He knows. And then I have the feast and the feast is set. It's ready to go. And he inspects the feast. It's got to happen soon because the food's going to spoil. And he inspects the feast. Good job, son. Meanwhile, over at the girl's house, she's got her wedding dress done. The girls, her sisters or her friends, have even painted up her hands and her feet with henna designs. They would have done this. You've seen it with women from India and Pakistan, but they did it then too, and they learned it from people in the East. These are not permanent tattoos, so it doesn't break the laws of Moses. And they would also paint up for the bride, they would paint the palms of her hands. And the reason they did that is she was not to do any work. They were to do it all for her. She's the bride. Therefore, she just has to sit and take the love. That was it. 
And so she would be dressed in the dress. She'd have all of these things on her hands and she would sleep in her dress with all of this on. With the girls around her, all of them would have little oil lamps. The oil lamps are very small and you put oil in them and you put a little wick in them. I've seen somebody demonstrate a great big one. Boy, are they wrong. It wasn't that way at all. They were just these little oil lamps. But when the bridegroom came, if it was at night, you had to light the lamps because they don't have lights you can switch on and they don't have street lights out there. The bridegroom is not to miss the bride. So they've got to have their lamps lit. You know Matthew chapter 25. I don't need to go into that. You got the idea. Jesus was talking about that part there. So they're with the bride. And the bridegroom is with his friends. And they're all sleeping in the same room. The girls all sleeping in the same room. So that when the bridegroom comes, the, they can dust off the bride. Get all the wrinkles out. Make sure her makeup is good. She puts, where's eye makeup? Where do they learn that? Egypt. A long time ago. They're really good at that. And the bridegroom, of course, he's with his friends and they're ready to go and get the bride. But they don't know when. Which is why Jesus, on a few different occasions, said, by the way, guys, when I come for you, no one knows the day or the hour. Not the angels of heaven. Not even me. Only my Father knows. When they heard that, they heard only one thing. Wedding. Did they understand it to be such? No. They wanted to be conquerors, not brides, as it were. But he was talking clearly about a wedding. Why is that so? And why is it peculiar, especially of a Galilean wedding? Because the reason only the father knew it was the son's way of honoring his father and by vicariously his mother, leaving the time of the wedding, the choosing of getting the bride completely up to him. He deferred to his father. That's why I've had a lot of people over the last few years come up to me and say, I know when Jesus is coming and they're ready to offer a date. And I said, don't even try because you don't know more than Jesus. And what I've had to tell the last two that had been at my church over the last two weeks, I said, you can pick the date. And if it's right, it's not going to matter. We're all going to be happy. <laughs> but if you're wrong, I want you at my church the next day to apologize to my congregation and they never come back. It's that serious. So Jesus doesn't know the day or the hour. And that's typical of the bridegroom because he has to wait till his father tells him to go. So everybody sleeps. It usually happens in the middle of the night, preferably during a full moon. You want to have some light out there. The weather has to be good. So the father, you know, looks at the weather, looks at the time of day. And finally he says, I'm going to send him. And he goes into the room. He's got to step over all the boys because it's a small room and it's full of these guys sleeping on the floor and his son's down there dressed for the wedding, ready to go. He doesn't know when it's going to happen. And the father leans down and goes, son, what? <laughs> son, what? <laughs> get up. <sighs> Why? Go get your bride. Boing! And he springs to his feet, wakes up all the guys, and he runs to the roof immediately. He grabs the shofar and, no, I won't do it. But he blows it, and it wakes up the whole village, which is the idea. Wake up the whole thing. Do it. Uh, and, and so he's up there blowing the shofar, and then he starts shouting, the bridegroom is coming. The bridegroom is coming. It's the alarm clock for the bride and her family. That's the main purpose behind it, but it is also the wake-up call for the guests. And so once he blows the shofar, the guys are already gathering musical instruments, drums. They're getting torches. There's, there's going to be a whole bunch of these guys, probably a dozen or more. We don't know. It could have been a lot. And the papa is downstairs ready to hold the gate open for them to exit. Two of the guys have a chair between two poles, or it's maybe even a platform that the woman can kind of sit modestly on cross-legged with her dress covering her. Either way, it's a way to carry her like a queen back to the house. And so they go out the door, the bridegroom leading. He's shouting, the bridegroom is coming, the bridegroom is coming. He's blowing the shofar, but he's not going straight to the bride's house. He's serpentining through the streets because... The guests have to get in the parade too. So the further they go, the louder and longer the train gets. 
And there, of course, are people who are not invited and they're looking out the windows going, well, that's going to be fun and I'm not part of it. Everybody else is throwing on their robes and running down the stairs because chances are in good weather they're sleeping on the roofs of their house. That's true. And they come down and they, the parade gets longer and they go through the streets until they've collected all the guests until they finally get to the bride's house her family in the meantime, they've gone out into the street. All of them are holding bowls with these oil lamps in it so the wind doesn't blow it out. I've done this before when we've done it in costume in a full-blown version of this wedding and these girls had, were lined up in beautiful costumes that they'd put together holding bowls of light in a pitch black hallway and it lit them from below. It was truly one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life. Now you've got a cluster of these people cramming into this, these little narrow streets of the village with the family there, perhaps holding torches, all the women holding the bowls with the lit lamps and the light. And in the middle is the bride holding her own bowl of light, as it were. And as they come around the corner, it's a showstopper. And the, of course, the bridegroom has to keep going because the parade will just push him right in. And so he goes up to the bride and the guys come with the litter. It's called a litter, what they're going to carry her on. Funny name for that, but you know, or a sedan chair, but we'll call it a litter because it's easier to say. And as they lay it down on the ground, the bride then gently steps over to the chair and she sits down on it or on the platform, if it's a platform type of a litter. It's all out in the open. And then the guys pick her up, put it on their shoulders like this, and they pick her up, hmm, off the ground. And then with the bridegroom leading and blowing the shofar and everybody in tow, they make a beeline to the bridegroom's house where he, the bride, the bridesmaids, all the guests go inside the house where the feast is waiting until the last person is in. The bridegroom's father, if he can afford it, gives every one of the guests a white linen robe to wear. That honors them and they can take it home with them as a wedding gift. And then the gate is shut and it's locked. And nobody goes out and nobody comes in for seven days and nights. Yeah. You see, Jesus' physical return to the earth and his return for his bride are two different things at two different times. And if you're wondering about those guests, how do they play into the illustration? It's all over the New Testament, even in places in the Old, where you have something called the resurrection of the dead. You can read about it in 1 Corinthians 15, in 1 Thessalonians 4. The worship leaders read that tonight. And what about that? Listen, the resurrection of the dead. Everybody gets a new body and they get to be with Jesus and they meet the Lord in the air, don't they? But what if you're alive when that happens? You're transformed in a twinkling of an eye, caught up with them. The rapture is just the resurrection of the dead contingency if you're alive when the resurrection of the dead takes place. And so we will be together with the Lord forever, for the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, with a trumpet blast and the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet them in the air, and so we will be together with the Lord forever. Encourage one another with these words. You will not go through the wrath. That's the deal. And that's exactly what Paul says next in 1 Thessalonians 5 and over in 2 Thessalonians. You are not destined to it because you're the bride. The bride ain't going through the wrath. And the illustration is airtight. That's what they heard. They didn't always believe it, but they definitely heard it and they definitely understood it. Which brings us to this. They end up at the wedding feast and they're at the wedding feast, which goes on for seven days and nights. Lots of things happen. Gifts are given. Blessings are given. People feast and they have a great time. People pray over the bride and groom. The bride and groom go and consummate the wedding while the party's going on. It sounds really weird, but that's what they did. They consummated the marriage then. And even so, at the very beginning, at the outset, the bridegroom would take that cup and that pitcher and pour the cup. And then he would take the first sip and then hand it to the bride, and she would take the sip. And over the course of the next several days, they would do this six more times. They are now together as family. They're now together as husband and wife. They're now together as perfect blood relations in their eyes for the rest of their lives. Over in Revelation chapter 19, 
John, after he saw the fall of Babylon the Great, says, And then I heard, as it were, a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and the bride has made herself ready. White linen, fine and clean, was given her to wear. White linen stands for the works, of, the righteous works of the saints. It's interesting, God gave us his righteous works, and we wear them at a wedding. And I saw that, and I went, man, that is going to be so amazing. You see, at the end of that whole view, John finds himself flat on his face in front of an angel, worshiping the angel. He doesn't know what to do with himself because it was so overwhelming. Some people even think because it's a vision, he saw himself out there. And it just overwhelmed him. Maybe that's the case. But either way, my imagination runs in a little different direction. Before I became a pastor and long before I became a law enforcement chaplain, which I'm retired from now, I was an artist. I was an art major in college. And I'm very visual in the way that I think. And that's why I love the subject, because Jesus spoke so visually. So did Paul. So did all the apostles, because of who they were. And when I think of it, I wonder, what will it look like? What will that wedding look like? And we have that description, but no details. Now, I know what my wedding looked like when I got married. I got married at Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa on June 16, 1970. Now, my wife would be very proud of me right now. <laughs> Guys, don't forget those dates. Pastor was not Pastor Chuck. We had requested a different pastor named Pastor Romaine. Some of you might remember him. And Pastor Romaine was the guy that did our wedding. And I'm standing up on the stage with my five groomsmen, and I'm wearing an all white polyester tuxedo with bell bottom pants and the white ruffles down the front. <laughs> I'm a hippie. So I've got really long hair. I can reach up my back and grab it, and I have a Fu Manchu mustache. And I'm standing next to Pastor Romaine, who was here, my five guys who were here wearing light blue versions of what I have on. That was really in at the time. And the door opens in the back, the music changes, and here comes the bridesmaids, one at a time, walking down, taking their position over here. And then the matron of honor, she was ma married, of course. She was, the, she was the, of course, the, the last one through. And the door's closed at the back. She comes up, and as she's ascending the four steps up to the front, they used to have stairs all the way around. If you've been there recently, those are gone. She ascends up, and she looks at me, and she winks. And it wasn't a flirt. It was, wait till you see what's coming. <laughs> the music changes again. The doors open up. And all the way at the back of this church that holds 2,700 people, and there's only 300 people in the middle of this thing. I say only. It would fill any other church. There's my bride, Kathy. And she is dressed to this day of all the probably a couple hundred weddings that I've done in the most beautiful wedding gown I've ever seen in my life. The veil comes all the way down to where her hands are clasping her bouquet. And she's gorgeous. She had cut her hair. Her hair was brown, but since she cut it, now it looks jet black. Her brown eyes are piercing. You can see them through the veil all the way from the back of the room. She's got perfect teeth, not like me. Hers are perfect. And she's smiling ear to ear. And as she's looking at the, all the people, her eyes shifting back and forth, and she looks at me and she just smiles. On her right arm is her dad, who looks like a WWF wrestler with a shaved head and a package of hot dogs behind his neck poured <laughs> into one of these light blue tuxedos with the bell-bottom pants, and they start walking down the aisle, and he is so proud to be walking her down the aisle. And she walks down, and they meet right down in front. Romaine says, go get her. And I stepped down the four steps, shook his hand, gave her, he gave, her my, uh, gave me her arm, and we walked back up. And Romaine, the pastor, began to speak. And I don't remember a word of it. <laughs> I did what he said. But all I could do was look at her, and there are Disneyland fireworks going off in her brown eyes, and she's smiling at me through that veil. I have my bride. What is Jesus like in heaven right now waiting for you? I know this is a bit of a romantic notion, 
but I don't know of any bridegroom that ever sat going, Father, I want to get my bride. Not now, son. Okay. No, I want my bride. I want my bride. He loves you. Jesus loves you. Don't mix it up with romance. It goes way deeper and way better than that. He wants his bride. And what does it look like, really? Do we have a description in the Bible? I think we have one. And it's very simply this. It's over in Ephesians. I just got a few minutes left. Hang on. It's in Ephesians chapter uh, 5 and verse 25. Some of you guys are going, oh no, here we go. It's about husbands. Listen, it star- I already said it once, but let me do it again because it's important. Husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Let's take that first part. Husbands love your wives. <laughs> Move it out of the way. Just leave that alone. We're not going there tonight. It's a great message for you to get into another time. <laughs> go get them, brother. <laughs> anyway, as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. You know what that means? Bride price. That's the bride price. Gave himself for her. You see, you're making this up. No, it's what they would have thought. You go do your own homework. You do your own investigation. You'll find it. It's right there. It's just people aren't looking at it. They're not looking for it. He is the bride price. He gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of the water through the word, born again, that he, if I were him, may present her to himself. There it is. There's the ceremony. Whatever it looks like, Jesus brings you to himself and he presents you to himself. A radiant bride, holy and blameless, without any stain or wrinkle or any other blemish. Back up just for a second. He has washed you, cleansed you with the washing with water through the word. He's paid the bride price for you. He presents you to himself. And what does he see? Radiance. Now, don't do it, but if it were daytime, you go outside, you look up at the sun. That's called radiance. When you see Jesus' face in the book of Revelation, his face is radiant like the sun. He looks at you. You're radiant. You say, I don't deserve to be there. You're right. He looks at you and he says, it's okay. I paid the price. I birthed you again into my kingdom through my word, the gospel. And you're radiant to me. But I did radiant. But I was radiant. But I lived radiant. But I'm radiant. This is how he sees you. Now and then. Now and then. You're radiant to him. Because he did all the work to make you that way. And one day he will physically present you to himself. That radiant bride. Why did God make the world? Well, he made it. You ever ask the question? Here we are, we got the universe. Why did he make it? He made the universe. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Why did he do that? And then he made Adam and Eve. I'm skipping lots of places, obviously. Man and woman. Why did he do that? And then they fell, and a lot of things happened. And then along comes Jesus to take care of all the sin that the world had accumulated during that time and take it all on himself. Why did he do that? To redeem someone to buy something for himself. And he died. We talk about this all week. And he rose. We talk about this all this week. And he ascended to his father with the promise to come back for his bride and take her to himself forever and ever and ever. A new heaven and a new earth are coming. A new Jerusalem will be there with him. He'll be with us forever and ever and ever. Why did God do all of that? I think ultimately it boils down to that one day in the future in heaven, that marriage feast of the Lamb, because it culminates with the Father has bought a bride with his own son's life for his son to be with him, to be together forever, because he made a covenant 
And the covenant was until death us do part and he doesn't die ever again. And when you're in that state, neither do you. This is why marriage is sacred. Marriage is all over the world. There are certain things inherent with us that you find everywhere in the world that are defined in Scripture. The law that we live and die by, so to speak. The moral law. We, everybody knows the Ten Commandments in one form or another. No matter what society, atheists, pagans, doesn't matter. And we all know marriage. It's cherished everywhere in the world. You see, marriage is more than a spiritual mating ceremony. It's a declaration. It's a picture. A living, breathing, moving picture of how Jesus loves his church and paid the price for her to have her forever until death us do part. It's a living, walking picture of it in every culture, even among atheists, even among pagans. It's still there to tell the world this is a gospel. This is really good news. And it's the way God greases the gears, as it were, for the message to come through that Jesus loves you, died for you, rose for you, is coming back for you, and wants you very, very badly to be with him forever. Which is why, also, adultery is such a big sin. Because it doesn't look anything like Jesus, and he will never do that to you. Why, and I'm going to use an old word, it's a good word, fornication. We call it premarital sex, it softens the blow. Fornication is an old King James word, but it's very severe, isn't it? It's why that is also a sin. Why? Because there's no covenant. And when two people live together as husband and wife, outside of the covenant of marriage, you can say, well, it's, it's, they're dedicated to each other. No, there's only one reason, really, when it boils down to it why two people would live together outside the covenant of marriage. It's because they can leave any time they want to if things go south. And Jesus will never leave us or forsake us like a covenanted bridegroom to a bride. And all the other perversions that can happen in marriage, if it doesn't look like Jesus, then it's the wrong picture. Marriage is sacred because it says Jesus all over the place. Which is why I love this. I just wrapped up teaching the book of Revelation at my church and we're just kind of summarizing it now and we'll be done with it by the end of April. But over in Revelation chapter 22, this is the last chapter of the Bible. These are the last words in the Bible. Jesus speaks and he says this, verse 7, Behold, I'm coming soon. You skip down to verse 12. Jesus says it again. Behold, I'm coming soon. You skip down to verse 17. There's a response. This is a conversation. Jesus speaks, I'm coming soon, I'm coming soon. What is he just saying, I'm coming soon? No, there's always a reason behind it in the context. The response of the conversation was the spirit and the bride say, come. This is the bridegroom telling the bride, I'm coming soon. Don't know when. My father hasn't told me yet, but I'm coming soon. And the bride says, come. And then verse 20, once again, in your red letter edition, it's right there. Second to the last verse in the whole Bible. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Last words in the Bible. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all God's people and all the witnesses shout. Amen. Amen. <laughs> now I'm going to show you something. Don't get the wrong idea. I didn't come here to sell you anything. These are donation only or free. Okay, no price on them. You want to do something, 10 bucks a piece, doesn't matter. But if you can't afford it, take it. Get it out there, take it. Because when you're done taking it, give it to somebody else and keep it going, right? 
Everything I said tonight is in that movie right there. It's called Before the Wrath, because I wrote the book. They made the, the movie based on the book. What I'm talking about tonight, it's in there. I told you more than what's in the movie, by the way, because it's a movie. It can't cover all of that, but it's in here. It's extremely well done. And when it went up on uh, live on Amazon, it shot straight to the top. It was in the top five videos of all formats, all types against Jumanji, uh, Frozen 2, and uh, 1917. And it stayed there for two and a half weeks until it dropped off the charts and then it stayed at the top of, of all documentaries, all formats, uh, all subject matter, number one for a whole year on Amazon. So Brent Miller, who put this thing together, it's not my movie, it's his, he did a really good job on it. And so there's a bunch of them back there. And if you want one, please take one. And uh, if you'd been to a biblical dinner, those of you that have been, new version of the book. So if you didn't get a book, they're back there. I got a whole bunch of those. And if there's not enough, you can always go on Amazon to buy one, unfortunately, because I don't have that many. But uh, there's some QR codes back there. So this is the Biblical Dinner book. It's completely revised. If you haven't gotten one, make sure you get one. Uh, if you got the old one, you might want to take a look at the new one. And the last one, I mentioned that I was with Placer County Law Enforcement Chaplaincy for 30 years. And off of that, I ended up writing a master's thesis on answering evil or how do you answer uh, for God when somebody, your neighbor, has the worst day of their life. Uh, we're talking really horrible stuff because that's what I had to deal with as, as a law enforcement chaplain. Um, this, these things are really easy reads. This one isn't. This is college level. And, uh, but if you're uh, in, in pastor, in ministry, or you want to kind of know what is the basis for me to be able to give any good news when only the worst things have happened, like Job and worse, to my neighbor or my friend or even somebody in the church. Um, you might want to take a look at this book, but it will work your brain bone pretty well. So with that, let me close in prayer with you guys and then turn you loose. You've been so patient to be here so long. Father, thank you for blessing us with Jesus. Lord, thank you. Thank you for loving us so much that you have brought us as a bride to your son that fantastic radiant bridegroom and you've made us radiant so we could be that way together forever. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. We can't wait to see you. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. God bless you. Thank you for having me here tonight. All right.